Is it water with the sheep in the in the box? It's Pride Month. I wasn't originally going to make a video this Pride because I feel like I didn't really have much to add. My queer experience isn't really all that interesting or groundbreaking. And I think that like most cishet passing people, I have a lot of complicated feelings around my sexuality and specifically if I even deserve to call myself a part of the community at all or if I should just kind of pretend to be no more than just an ally but as I've got older I've mostly decided that you know what as the greatest philosopher of our time once said you know we're superstars we are who we are this will be a little less focused and tightly scripted than my normal video essays because I just thought we could have a bit of a chat you and I I will be putting out another one of those videos soon enough either way so I guess it's time to say hi I'm Matt and I'm pansexual and yes I'm cis please stop asking I just care about marginalized people and groups I'm allowed to do that without actually necessarily being a part of them I've mostly dated and slept with cis women though not exclusively and there's a few complications to that as well which I'll get into later turns out sexuality is more complex than I first thought so let's discuss my experience shall we Like most pan people, I first thought I was bi, and to be perfectly honest, there's really very little difference between bisexuality and pansexuality, so I guess before I get into my experience, let's discuss the nuanced, and for some people slightly confusing, distinction between these two similar but distinct orientations and identities. Essentially, bisexuality refers to people who are attracted to people of all, or at least multiple, genders. The bi part may imply that, yes, bisexuals are only attracted to two genders, or that they're gender essentialists by nature and don't get me wrong, those people do exist, but they're not representative of the norm or the majority in the same way JK Rowling is not representative of all women and Blair White is not representative of all trans people. Pansexuality, on the other hand, refers to a sexual attraction towards people regardless of their gender, as opposed to just being attracted to every or multiple gender identities. To put it another way, a bi person is attracted to, let's say, men, women and non-binary people potentially for different reasons, whereas a pan person is attracted to people and the gender of the person never factors into that whole process. There's a lot of debate in the community because the point is supposed to be that pansexual people essentially don't see gender whereas bisexuals love people of different genders for different reasons and there's an interesting discussion to be had about which term is preferable and where they apply. Completely disregarding gender or embracing it wholeheartedly, there's often very little distinction there. There is no answer but of course bi and pan twitter never shut the fuck up about it. Due to the way that the term pansexuality implies a rejection of the gender binary, it's often considered a more inclusive term than bisexual which may imply an embracing of it, though bi people, I hasten to add, do often find themselves attracted to non-binary people. It's just a subtle and minor distinction which nevertheless matters to a lot of people. Also, I really really like to have sex with saucepans. There have been numerous attempts over the years to categorise and put labels on gender and sexuality. Until relatively recently in the West, other cultures have been better in this regard throughout history, which reactionaries like to pretend isn't true, gender, much like sexuality, was assumed to be a binary, in that you were either straight or an abomination against God, and whilst now we can celebrate that improving, for trans people, and especially non-binary trans people, it's a slow process. As I believe I mentioned multiple times during my Ariel Scarcella videos, trans people now are suffering through what the LGB community suffered through for much of the past hundred years. Anyway, there have been several attempts to map sexuality from the Kinsey scale to the Klein grid method to the Sasso or self-assessment of sexual orientation, which is essentially an updated version of the Kinsey scale, and more recently the multi-dimensional scale of sexuality which aims to place sexuality on a spectrum. All of these have significant flaws, though the closest is the MSS and the generally accepted status quo at the moment is that sexuality is indeed on a spectrum, much like gender. The reason I bring this up is to point out that generally these labels, straight, gay, bisexual, pansexual, etc, are not set in stone but merely ways for people to describe their position on the spectrum. After all, if gender isn't really a thing and is in fact entirely socially constructed, which is what I believe, then what does that mean for sexuality? Again, nobody knows, but it seems to me that what we're attracted to are traits rather than genders. If a straight guy can be attracted to a femboy, for example, without knowing that they're male, then this whole idea is obviously more complex than we give it 
appropriate credit. Sexuality and gender are in many ways inherently linked, and I think that as we start to break down the gender barriers and talk more openly about trans issues, we might start to see a shift in the way that we approach sexuality as well. Am I saying that everyone is secretly a pansexual? No, of course not, and I hate people that do that, they're incredibly obnoxious. But I think that discussions about gender and the gender liberation movement as a whole may at least encourage more people to think more deeply about it, which I think is always a positive thing. Think of it this way, if gender can be more fluid than we often think, surely that means that sexuality can as well. I think about this a lot. In general, I tend to go for more stereotypically feminine men and masked people, twinks I suppose you could say, and more stereotypically strong, independent, powerful women and femme people, but it's more kind of this middle space that I enjoy, regardless of gender identity or anything like that. This is just me, of course, I do know other people have a much broader range of preferences, but for me this is kind of the area I like to operate in, so to speak. Am I really pan then? Or do I just have a preference? I'll get into that a bit later on. If you've been following the channel for any appreciable amount of time, you'll be extremely aware that I have quite the eclectic range of weird niche interests, and one of those is vexillology, or the study of flags. I just find it fascinating the philosophy, meaning, and often mathematical precision that goes into the creation of a flag and what it represents. Most people will know the famous ones like the stars and stripes representing the states and the original 13 colonies, and each of the colours have relevant philosophical meanings. Likewise, the flag of the United Kingdom is a composite flag made up of England's of St George, Scotland's flag of St Andrew, and Ireland's flag of St Patrick. Wales can go fuck itself I guess, but did you know that the Jamaican flag, for example, has deep meaning as well? As far as I can surmise, the black sections symbolise the strength and creativity of the Jamaican people. The gold saltire, the cross bit, stands for the natural wealth and beauty of sunlight, and the green represents hope and agriculture. There's actually a handy list of guidelines put out by the North American Vexillological Association which outlines best practices for flag design which are essentially worthless, because because on the first page of the PDF it states that design principles are guidelines, not rules. They help designers create flags that will be effective, widely adopted, and loved. In some cases it makes sense to depart from the guidelines to reach a creative, compelling, or politically acceptable solution. Like all fields of design, flag design, vexillography, has a rich and complex history with many nuances. Any full account is beyond the scope of this booklet. Interested readers should seek out the many excellent and informative papers and perspectives in periodicals such as Nava's Raven and Vexillum, along with the flag design resources and case studies on nava.org. It can be tempting to use these principles to denigrate poorly designed flags. The specific examples here only serve to illuminate the principles by showing flags that fail to follow them. All this to say that the pansexual flag is, in my opinion, gaudy, fluorescent garbage and I hate it so fucking much. It's ugly, it's in your face is insistent, despite having a very similar intention to, for example, the bi flag, in that the cyan portion of the flag represents sexual attraction to those who identify as male, the magenta represents sexual attraction to those who identify as female, and the yellow represents sexual attraction to non-binary people. In much the same way as on the trans flag, pink represents trans women and trans femme people, the blue represents trans men and trans mask people, and the white portion represents non-binary people. And honestly, this flag is aesthetically gorgeous, at least to my eye, and I'm burdened with this shit? I bought one for this video but it got lost in the post and honestly I can't even say I'm particularly put out about that. And to think, until a couple of years ago I identified as bi and I could proudly display this masterpiece. Here, again, the pink is for the same gender attraction, blue is for different gender attraction, and purple is to represent the attraction across the gender spectrum. The history behind it is fascinating with its origins in this so-called bi-angle symbol. In fact, the person who originally designed the flag once said, the key to understanding the symbolism of the bisexual pride flag is to know that the purple pixels of colour blend unnoticeably into both the pink and blue, just as in the real world, where bi people blend unnoticeably into both the gay and lesbian and straight communities. And as a result, the flag evokes a clear impression of fluidity as one colour fits seamlessly into the next, and the way the middle portion is smaller and also a mix of the other two colours feels like the two sides are pushing against one another and blending, creating something beautiful and new. And I gave that up for this fucking monstrosity. At this point, is it even worth it?
for any long-term subscribers of mine, there is inevitably going to be a burning question that you're going to be wanting to ask, and the answer is yes, my sexual and psychological issues are definitely going to be discussed. It's been a while, I feel like it's okay to talk about it again. For those of you who don't know, I have a form of sex or love addiction, which essentially means that I find it functionally impossible to exist or to be happy outside of a relationship. I constantly and obsessively seek validation from a partner, and the only time I feel like life is worth living or that I'm worthy of existing existence is to go down on another person. Without a partner, I have no ambition, no reason to live, no drive to well, do anything. That's why when I'm single, I don't look after myself, my diet is shit, I don't bother exercising, I actively punish myself for existing until I meet someone. All of a sudden, when I have a partner, I have motivation, I have a reason to live, to be healthy, to look after my body, to go out and do things, to, well, to live. I've been in and out of therapy for this, I'm determined to keep going at it this time though. As a result, it's often like I'll go looking desperately for someone, anyone, to make come on my tongue so that I can stop being a fat, depressed, worthless piece of shit. I think I've mentioned before that at its peak when I was with my ex-fiance, I once went down on her for so long that my face started to wear off. I didn't realise at the time that maybe that's indicative of some kind of deeper issues. As a result, this has a lot of influence over my sexuality and then there's the whole romance versus sexuality sexuality thing to navigate. Okay, let's talk about that, I guess. So, I'm pansexual, but so far I've only been in serious long-term relationships with women and one envy person. I've just never been able to build the kind of deep emotional bond I've felt for previous partners for another guy, which is extremely odd to me because I'm very into men sexually, but there just seems to be this, this disconnect when I try to envision myself seriously dating any of the men I've slept with. For me, sex with a guy is just a bit fun and never really turns into anything more serious, though the sex, and especially the oral sex, still gives me that same rush I just just, I don't get it. Maybe it's all part of my weird, messed up mental health stuff. Maybe I'm pansexual but not panromantic, or it could just be that I've just not found the right guy. It's very confusing to me. It certainly doesn't help that the last time I went on Grindr, some guy sent me a message asking me to shit on him, so of course I immediately deleted the app. I don't know, I often kind of feel like an outsider, forever on the fringes of the community, unable to really engage with it on a deeper level because I feel like a fraud, a liar, a fake LGBTQ+, a, a cishet who fucks the occasional dude. I know it's stupid, I know I'm being ridiculous, but this is the way we've been taught to feel. The LGBTQ plus community should be, and for the most part is, an inclusive, loving place, and it's where many of us feel safe and secure. I just wish I felt like I fit. Is it water with the sheep in the, in the box? A wank, I think.